Hi, I'm Sam, and today I'll be talking about how the design of preference languages shapes participation in algorithmic decision making. There are many contexts in which a decision maker needs to make a decision that will impact a large number of people. In those contexts, decision makers might want to know how they can make decisions at scale that align with stakeholders' needs and goals. One way of doing this is to design a preference language, give that to stakeholders in the community, and ask them to tell you their preferences over the decision outcome. The decision maker can then decide how they will aggregate those preferences to make a final decision. There are lots of examples of these kinds of systems, which we will refer to as preference-based systems. For example, our work has focused on the systems that assign students to public schools in many US cities. In this context, the decision maker is the school district and the community members are the students who are looking for schools and their families. In most cases, the school district asks the families to rank the available schools in order of their preference. This is the preference language. The school district then uses a matching algorithm to find an optimal assignment of students to schools that satisfies families' preferences, as well as schools' capacity constraints. Other preference-based systems use other kinds of preference languages. For example, Friedman et al. designed a system to align organ donation matching with the general public's values. In this case, they ask participants to make pairwise comparisons between potential recipients and use those preferences to weight donation matches. In a third example, Lee et al. worked with a food donation organization and various stakeholders like donor organizations, recipient organizations, and volunteers to build a model that would match donations to recipients in line with stakeholders' preferences. In this case, the preference language was a set of relevant factors about donors and recipients and participants were asked to weight the relative importance of each factor. What we can see from these examples is that there are many ways to design a preference language. And what we argue in this work is that these choices shape participants' opportunities for meaningful participation in algorithmic decision-making. We draw on 27 semi-structured interviews in this work, which we collected over the course of two years of research in two neighboring school districts, in San Francisco and Oakland, California. In this paper, we draw on these findings to make a broader case about preference-based systems. But if you're interested in a more in-depth discussion of student assignment algorithms specifically, please check out our prior work at CHI 2021 and CSCW 2022. Based on our analysis of the student assignment context, as well as the literature on other preference-based systems, we define three dimensions of preference languages that we can look at to understand how the design of these languages shapes and can limit opportunities for participation. These dimensions are expressiveness, cost, and collectivism. I'll explain each of these in a little more detail before moving on to discuss potential paths forward. Expressiveness refers to the fidelity with which the preference language can express a person's preferences. Preference languages are designed to be structured so that they can scale to large groups of people. However, this means that it is not possible to express every detail of every person's needs and goals. Expressiveness becomes a potential problem when a preference language is more expressive for some stakeholders than for others. For instance, in the student assignment setting, most families want a school that will offer high quality education and resources to their child. However, because of historical inequality in education, such a school is not practically available to every student. For example, because of transportation constraints. One parent we interviewed actually learned to drive because the bus took too long to take her son to the school she wanted him to attend. The second dimension is cost. Cost refers to how much time and effort it takes for participants to figure out how to express their needs and goals in the structured preference language. Cost might be high because the person hasn't thought about their needs in this domain before. For example, they don't know what to look for in a school or because the preference language is not a good match for how they think about their needs. For example, they know what they want in a school but they don't know which of the available schools offers those things. Another parent we interviewed actually attended a week-long class offered in her community to learn about the public school enrollment process. She told us that this process was very hard. People just assume that you know what you're doing and I had not a clue. Again, costs can shape opportunities for participation in a problematic way when some participants face higher costs than others or when some participants have more time and resources to invest in the process. The last dimension is collectivism. We use collectivism to refer to the extent to which the preference language can work towards community level rather than on the individual level goals. Many preference-based systems are focused on satisfying individual preferences, which we show is a limited means for achieving collective goals, like diversity and equity in the public school context. 
Now that we've defined each of these dimensions, let's discuss some paths forward. The first two dimensions I introduced were mainly factors to do with the way that preferences are elicited. We suggest three potential ways to address these challenges. First, expressiveness can be a problem when some participants have better options available than others. For example, higher quality schools close to their home. One way to address this is by investing resources in improving the underlying set of options. This often came up as a preferred, though long-term, strategy in the context of student assignment. It is worth highlighting here that technical interventions in the system are not the only or best way to improve outcomes for participants. Another way to address both expressiveness and cost challenges is to change the preference language to be simpler or a closer match for how people think about their preferences. For example, pairwise comparisons may be easier than ranking or weighting options if someone hasn't thought a lot about their preferences before. Lastly, it is always important to offer support for participants in these processes, particularly those who may face higher costs and have less time to participate. This is something we discuss in much more detail in our prior work, so please check that out if this is something that interests you. The third dimension of preference languages, collectivism, has more to do with preference aggregation than elicitation. We discussed two complementary strategies for designing preference-based systems that can work towards collective as well as individual goals. Collectivism is only really a problem when there are some collective goals that are not perfectly aligned with individual preferences. That means that satisfying those goals will require some individuals to concede certain personal preferences. So if we're going to optimize for those collective goals, it's important that those goals have some degree of collective buy-in. The theory of procedural justice gives us insight into how to design decision-making processes that people perceive as legitimate and fair, even if their individual decision outcome is not exactly their first preference. Drawing on this theory, we argue for co-defining collective goals with communities through a process that gives participants a voice in decision-making and a clear understanding of how decisions were made. Once we have collective goals defined, we could then make adjustments to existing matching algorithms or develop new algorithms based on mathematical programming to more explicitly account for those goals when aggregating individual preferences. Coming back to our core argument, we have shown that the way we design a preference language strongly shapes participants' opportunities for meaningful and equitable participation. But there still remains a question as to whether these systems can really be considered participatory algorithmic decision-making at all. Our findings clearly show that preference elicitation alone doesn't align with the values of participatory processes. For example, in student assignment, families have little to no say of the conditions or structure of their participation or how the system should work overall. Other preference-based systems in the literature somewhat address this problem by integrating other forms of engagement with participants, such as conducting interviews or surveys to define what the preference language should look like. We argue that another opportunity for deepening participation is in co-defining the collective goals that the system should support. However, what our findings really highlight is that the specific configuration of the preference language and the broader opportunities for giving input are critical factors in determining whether a preference-based system is truly increasing people's power and voice in algorithmic decision-making. Thank you so much, and I hope you'll check out our paper, Expressiveness, Cost, and Collectivism, How the Design of Preference Languages Shapes Participation in Algorithmic Decision-Making. <laughs>